to be with you. I should also like to thank those of you who are listening to me for in inviting me into your living rooms or offices or wherever you may be. Um, as you will see, I'm speaking to you from the study of my flat, which is located in the Austrian city of Graz, which you can see on your screen. Uh, if you're curious, I'm located just behind the building on the bottom left, which is Graz University. Uh, the fourth photo, by the way, shows not a classical philosopher, as you might think at first glance, but one of Graz's best-known sons, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, actually, perhaps not a good person to show at a language conference. If you've seen any of his films, you might agree with me that his muscles are, are much more impressive than his English. Um, his German, by the way, is even less uh, impressive. Now, <clears throat> as we know, the theme of our conference is 21st century linguistics and language teaching. So I wonder what you're thinking when you see me and the title of my talk, Teaching Grammar. Perhaps you're thinking, just a minute, what's going on here? I'm expecting to hear about latest developments and what happens? This old man turns up and starts talking about grammar. What's that got to do with the 21st century? I mean, grammar is so 20th century or even 19th century. Now, you may be right. <clears throat> I think it's true to say that much of grammar teaching in textbooks and classrooms around the world does indeed reflect how it was taught in the 19th century. So I now have about 30 minutes to convince you that grammar can indeed be at the cutting edge of language teaching and learning. Uh, I might also be able to convince you that I may be old in body, but I'm young in ideas, but let's see. Now, I should add that I'm going to cover quite a lot of ground in my talk and will bombard you with PowerPoint slides. I'd advise you at this stage not to try to make notes. Later, you'll have access to my lecture on YouTube, I think, where you can press the pause button and make copies of slides at your leisure. <clears throat> As you can see from my title, I'm presenting an approach to grammar, which I call cognitive plus communicative, which I hope to be able to convince you is indeed a 21st century approach. Now, this kind of approach is quite different from traditional ways of teaching grammar. CC grammar is based, first of all, loosely on theories of language and learning deriving from what is known as cognitive linguistics, which you may or may not be familiar with. Secondly, principles of learning and teaching common to communicative language teaching, with which you are no doubt very uh, familiar. In addition, I shall attempt to integrate grammar into other areas of teaching and learning, which are inferential in the 21st century, such as competence orientation and what I call a learner perspective. Now, <clears throat> you might be thinking this sounds all a bit complicated, or you might think, well, my grammar teaching works fi fine, so why complicate it with all this theory? Indeed, you might be reminded of a statement once made by Alan Maley, which often strikes a chord of fam familiarity among teachers. We've combined theory and practice. Nothing works and no one knows why. Now, with grammar, of course, we want an approach which is both theoretically sound and which works uh, in the classroom. I might add that I've used the CC approach to guide grammar books and school textbooks that I've written. It's a model that I present in, a teach, in the teacher education at my own university and in workshops I often hold for teachers. So I'll be illustrating the theoretical framework with practical examples from my own books. Before looking at grammar principles and practice, we need first to consider certain aspects of what might be termed the grammar mindset problem, which often inhibits rational discussion of grammar teaching and blocks innovation. <clears throat> when I'm holding grammar workshops for teachers or for students, I often begin by asking them what adjectives they associate with grammar. Perhaps you might like to consider this yourself. What adjective comes into your mind when you think of grammar? I wonder how many of you have chosen boring. 
because in almost every country I go to, boring is the word that first has come up, usually followed by words like difficult, confusing, etc. In other words, many teachers have mainly negative associations with grammar. Now, the question that we might ask ourselves is why pick on grammar? Do we have the same negative associations with vocabulary or teaching oral skills? I think not. Could it perhaps be that it's not grammar that's boring, but the way we teach it? Which brings us to the second point. Grammar teaching has for a long time and continues to be dominated by traditional methods. This leads us to confuse tradition with theory because it is widely taught and has been for a long time in specific ways, we assume that there must be sound underlying theories. In my view, much of grammar teaching is one of the least theoretical areas of language teaching. Now, all language teaching needs to be based on principles to an extent deriving from theories of learning and teaching. We as teachers need to be able to justify why we teach something in one way as opposed to another. So let's start exploring some theories which might make grammar a bit less boring and more importantly, more effective for our learners and for teachers. <clears throat> First, we we'll look at communicative uh, language teaching and consider how that might be relevant to grammar. One comment that I've often heard teachers make is this one. <clears throat> I teach communicatively, but I teach grammar too. Uh, as you can perhaps imagine, this is a comment that doesn't exactly fill me full of joy. Now, this is not intended as a criticism of teachers. Writing a few years ago, the applied linguist Michel Achard expressed the view that the integration of grammar in communicative models is one of the hardest challenges that teachers face. <clears throat> so far, I've used the term traditional grammar several times, but haven't yet explained exactly what I mean by this, nor shown how its practices might differ from communicative grammar activities. And I begin to do this first by means of examples, and then with the help of analysis. The two examples that I will show you are both activities to practice uh, tenses. This first one is a format commonly found in grammar practice books where students are given blank sentences and fill in gaps using an answer word in brackets. The student's role is fairly limited, simply to add grammar to another person's ideas. <clears throat> so let's look at a different uh, activity with the title, I am unique. Now this activity also provides tense practice and, con and consists, but consists of incomplete sentences, which cue ideas, which the student has to express based on his or her uh, own experience. In this case, the student has to provide not only a correct tense form, but a complete utterance. So, how does this uh, work? <clears throat> the exercise has a sp specific task. Students have to try and find examples from their own experiences, which no one else in class shares. Now, I'll give you one or two examples of my own. Unfortunately, uh, this may work well in class, but it certainly doesn't work on the internet because we can't get any feedback. So imagine you're in a classroom. Uh, let me take one example from my own experience, the very first one. I am the only person in this room who uh, goes to a football match uh, every month, uh, at least. Uh, when I say that, I should add, of course, sadly, not during uh, lockdown. I wonder, do you, this, do you do this too, or am I unique? Uh, if we've got any football fans watching, probably not. I'll just tell you that this game you can see was a wonderful evening when my local team, Sturm Graz, won the Austrian Cup a couple of years ago. And my son came over from England especially to watch the great event. <clears throat> Let's take a second example. 
I am the only person in the room who has made a parachute jump. I wonder, am I? <clears throat> you might wonder why I did this rather strange thing. Um, well, actually, this was a wonderful 70th birthday present from my, my three children, which made me very happy. <clears throat> Much better than the, uh, the reading lamp. They did. It was boring and very much an old man's uh, present. Now, this exercise um, and the fill in the gap both have the same grammatical objective to practice different tenses, but use different methods. So let's have a look at some communicative principles, which will help us to point to one or two of the differences between them. I'll just pick out three from the list which you can see in front of you which are particularly relevant for today's discussion. <clears throat> First of all, uh, the, the third point, meaning of language and overall message is stressed. Now, grammar is a system of meanings encoded into forms, not a set of syntactic patterns. In I am unique, students are using tense meanings and vocabulary to create meaningful utterances. The second point I'll refer to is the one second from the bottom in brackets, personalization. When using language, I, as a speaker, use grammar to express what I think, what I know, what I feel, not to slot bits of grammar into other people's sentences. Then we'll look at the category purposeful task-based. The game structure of I Am Unique builds in a task which students will act upon and which has um, an outcome which makes it a purposeful activity. And let's finally mention implicit learning. Learners learn grammar in different ways. Learning about and analyzing language may be one. <clears throat> Using it is another. As teachers, we need to offer various paths to learning. Now, I should say that the list of communicative principles are general guiding principles that take us in a communicative direction. We're not necessarily saying that principles have to be adhered to in every exercise, otherwise the exercise is no good. Communicative grammar is not just a question of replacing exercises with games. <clears throat> Sometimes quite small changes are possible to make an exercise a little bit more communicative. For example, by giving an exercise more of a stress on meaning. Let's take an example from a widely used uh, grammar book. Now, this exercise has a familiar format, blank sentences, fill in the gap, words provided in brackets. It also has lead-in sentences, which apparently provide a context um, to help the students uh, get to the right answer. But do these lead-in sentences actually contribute to the exercise? If we remove them, the students can still do the exercise. He had gone, it had closed, he had died, uh, and so on. <clears throat> Another interesting thing is that if we replace the words in brackets with nonsense words like this, it's still quite possible to do the exercise. He had blonked, it had flimped, he had chunk, chopped, she had nugged, he had zosted, and so on and so on. <clears throat> this is something that uh, might cause us concern because it shows that we can do the whole exercise without focusing at all on meaning. <clears throat> this exercise is what I tend to call a uh, quick fix grammar, which gives instant feedback, but feedback of what? In my view, very little cognitive processing is needing, needed, and the quality of learning is very low. As the former American president might have said, we might perhaps regard it as fake learning. Not that I wish to identify with the former president, uh, I should add. <clears throat> now, it is possible to make a simple improvement to the exercise by removing the words in brackets like this. Now students have to make both grammatical and semantic choices and need to, intake, and need to take into account 
the context provided by the first sentences. So in my view, this is quite an improvement. But as I said, CC grammar is not a question of abandoning traditional exercises in favor of games. We need a methodological framework that incorporates all valid types of grammar activities, which can be used at appropriate stages of learning and as a means to assess how, effect how effective activities are. I'll return to this issue in a moment. <clears throat> Let's now move to the next category of competence orientation. Competences have become a buzzword in, in modern education, and in my opinion, a very positive buzzword. Uh, I think there are two very general aspects to this concept. First of all, it points to a, a, a broader view of the learner and the learner's knowledge, which is embedded in cognitive, affective, social aspects of um, human learning, of human beings. Thus, the common European framework defines competences as the sum of knowledge, skills, and characteristics that allow a person to perform actions. We'll come back to this characteristics uh, in a moment. Second, <clears throat> um, uh, competences points us in the direction of learner outcomes, not what learners know, but what learners can actually do with grammar. Now, the phrase knowledge, skills and characteristics takes us into the next category, which is the learner perspective. Let's begin <clears throat> a brief exploration of this term by means, means of uh, a cartoon. Here we've got a, a doctor, a nurse, and a patient. The doctor says, I'm afraid the patient is dead, nurse, <clears throat> says the patient. Oh, no, I'm not, says the nurse. Uh, Be quiet. <laughs> the doctor knows best. Now, just as we tend to assume that doctor knows best, so we often assume that teacher knows best. Now, Am I challenging teachers' knowledge, teachers' professionalism? Uh, no, of course, uh, I'm not. Uh, it's important that we take both the teacher's and a learner's perspective um, to learning. We don't abandon the, the teacher's perspective, which we bring into the classroom and which steers our methodology and our teaching, but rather it's a case of complementing it by attempting to see the learning and teaching of grammar not only through the eyes of the teacher, but through the eyes, or to be more exact, through the minds of the learner. This entails knowing what kind of activities lead to high quality learning for specific learners. This perspective entails taking into, into account the cognitive and effective needs and resources that learners bring into the classroom. And this is where cognitive linguistics comes in. <clears throat> One problem with uh, communicative language teaching was that while it provided a general framework for methodology, it did not provide coherent theories of learning, apart from a very general learning by using uh, rationale. Now, as uh, the linguist Michel Achard states, no pedagogical decision can be made in the absence of learning theory. The question is, where is learning theory, which can be directly applied to grammar pedagogy, to come from? To answer this, we can turn to the general parameters of cognitive grammar. Now, cognitive grammar provides us both with theories of language description and of language learning. The language, uh, the language theories provide an important framework for approaching grammatical descriptions through its system of meanings as opposed to forms and feed into pedagogical tasks such as formulating grammar rules and specifying grammatical uh, obje objectives. My own grammar books are based on this cognitive approach. But due to constraints of time, today we shall just consider aspects of learning. I said earlier that a cognitive approach focuses on the cognitive resources that learners bring to their learning 
Two principal resource categories are cognitive needs of human beings, which apply both in real life and in the classroom, and cognitive processes which are activated when human beings learn, when they make sense of and memorize new information. <clears throat> Here you can see some examples of different types of, of needs, cognitive, affective, and communicative. For example, in the real world, when we come across something new, a new object or a new, a new person, a new piece of information, this attracts our attention, it stands out, and we have the desire to discover what it is and what it might mean. As far as effective needs are concerned, we want to be successful, we want, want to have positive experiences uh, in, in life, we want to have fun from time to time. As far as communication is concerned, we need to share our thoughts and ideas with other human beings. So these are principles which guide in to all of language teaching. And I think in much of modern language teaching, these cognitive needs are taken um, into account. However, as far as grammar is concerned, I feel this is not often the case. Think of the boring fill in the gap exercises, for example, and cast your eyes over this list of needs to see which they might fulfill. It's one of the premises of my approach to grammar <clears throat> that the more these cognitives are met, the more likely learners are to engage with grammar learning. And strong engagement leads us into the next category, cognitive processes. Here, you can see a definition of what cognitive processes are what is going on in the human brain when we learn, when we perceive, categorize, conceptualize, and remember new information. The extent to which learners make use of these processes in their classroom, in their classroom learning, depends to a large extent on the learning tasks and activities they're given by the teacher. For example, if a teacher explains a new piece of grammar to a class, some students may listen carefully and engage with the explanation. For others, the information will go in through one ear and out through the other, as we all know. On the other hand, if the teacher gives students a grammar discovery exercise where they are given the task of using language input to discover a new rule, they're more likely to attend to this grammar to make generalizations about what this grammar might mean. So the processing is, is more intensive. <clears throat> Littlemore points out that the type of exercise or nature of exposure will influence how well new grammar becomes entrenched in memory. And this leads to a general premise of a CC approach to activity design, that the more actively cognitive processes are employed, the more effective learning will be. Finally, we'll consider how the CC view of learning can feed directly into grammar activity uh, design. I'm sorry, um, I've gone a bit too fast. Let's go back one more. <clears throat> to do this, we shall incorporate principles from communicative language uh, teaching and an awareness of the cognitive resources that learners bring into the classroom. To this, we shall add the last category a stage model of learning. Now, stage models figure in many theories of learning and focus on how learners progress through initial awareness to a state where they can use grammar fluently and with little conscious attention. Essentially, we're concerned with the question of how is input from the teacher or the textbook converted into successful output uh, by the learner. The CC stage model, which we shall now discuss, includes four learning stages. First, initial awareness of new grammar and paying attention to it. Then, conceptualization, where a new rule is stored in the learner's mind. Next, we have the category of proceduralization, where learners have the opportunity to rehearse the new grammar and use it to express their own ideas and to gain confidence. This is a stage which is often missing from traditional grammar. 
And finally, we have the stage of performance where learners use both the new and other grammar in their repertory to fulfill a more global task. So let's have a look at examples from each uh, stage. Jump this one, right? <clears throat> First of all, awareness conceptualization. Uh, we'll put these two categories together since in teaching they go hand in hand. The question to consider here is how can we get learners to engage with and register the new grammar in their brain on the one hand, and on the other, how can we help them to store this new knowledge in the brain? There are various pedagogical options uh, to do this. We can, of course, explain grammar and give a guided exercise um, to enforce conceptualization. Uh, we can get students to discover rules for themselves. We can rely on examples of language and to illustrate um, a grammar rule or how grammar is used. And in this case, we might not provide any explanation at all. Uh, I'm going to give you an example of the fourth option, learning by using. And this, again, is a grammar game <clears throat> called The Most Exciting Life. What happens here is that learners work in small groups with the worksheet you can see before you. And the aim of the, uh, the activity is to discover which person in the group has had the most exciting life by comparing what each person uh, has done. You might think that these uh, examples are not very uh, exciting. You might want to change them and put in your own examples. Now here, students ask, ask each other questions and are given points for their answers. So, have you ever slept in the open air? Um, no, I haven't. You get zero points for that. If you've done it lots of times, you get uh, three points. So, gradually, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> the, the, the students answer all the questions and add up their school the scores and finally see who in the group has had the most exciting life. Now, in addition to communicating real information to each other, which they're usually interested in, they're practicing a grammatical obje objective. In this case, the notion of what I call experience using the present perfect um, form. Um, cognitive grammar um, <clears throat> identifies all uh, teaching objectives. In, in terms of meaning as well as form. And here, students acquire an implicit knowledge of the rule without uh, necessarily an explanation. <clears throat> so they pick it up by using it themselves. The overall rationale in perhaps preferring this form of conceptualization activity to, say, explanation is that it fulfills various cognitive needs and increases the engagement of students and that it requires deeper depth of processing. It thus leaves a longer trace in memory structures. Now we come to the um, procedural stage, particularly important, as I say, it's one that's often not included in grammar teaching. <clears throat> Cognitive psychologists sometimes distinguish between so-called declarative knowledge at the conceptualization stage, knowing about grammar, and procedural knowledge, knowing how to use grammar. So it is the task of this stage to provide activities where students can use and rehearse specific items of grammar. Activities at this stage need to be open-ended. Students need to have the opportunity to try out the grammar to express their own ideas. The activity I'm going to show you is again a game-like activity which involves um, two future notions. First of all, what I call expressing intention, uh, using going to and making a prediction using um, will. <clears throat> now, what happens here is that we have a lead-in sentence lent a lead-in sentence which provides a cue for students to add one of their own. So um, uh, this uh, kind of structure, by the, by the way, is one you'll often find in real life, where someone tells you what he or she is going to do, and then someone else predicts um, something in connection with uh, that. 
So here we've got an example, uh, the Q sentence, my family and me are going camping um, to Scotland at Easter. Um, and now uh, learners have to make predictions. Now, an important motivating element here is that students make both good friend and bad friend uh, predictions. And this fun element leads to a high degree of um, engagement. Uh, you'll find that students very much like, like making bad friend predictions in my experiences. This written activity can also be used as an oral activity. And I think oral grammar activities are particularly important because they involve real time processing. So here, all you need to do is to put the, the sentence on a cue card, uh, and that's basically it. Um, one student reads out a card, and all of the others have to make predictions about this uh, event. This is what I call a communicative drill. On the one hand, students are consolidating the meaning and form of this grammar by using it lots of times, but it also, and this is the communicative bit, provides them with a rehearsal using utterances they might make in real life. <clears throat> Here's one of the two other examples from this particular game. I'm going to start judo lessons next week. You'll get very strong and fit. You'll break your arm. These are all example uh, answers that I've heard from pupils. This is an interesting one. I'm going to have tea with my English teacher on Saturday. Perish the thought. <laughs> Finally, we come to a performance activity, and I'll give you one example of that. Earlier, we looked at the I am unique activity. Um, now, by adding an additional task, we can create a new activity which falls within the performance stage. As you can see here, this is a more extended task. The student has to write a report, uh, a longer text, but incorporating the grammar uh, which forms the teaching objective. Finally, <clears throat> let's just look briefly at two summaries of some of the most important points that I've attempted to make over the last half hour. <clears throat> Firstly, a list of um, factors which may help to optimize learning. I think all of these we've um, touched on in the course of our dis dis uh, discussions. Let's, however, just focus on the first one, repetition. Most learning theories agree that a lot of contact with language is a prerequisite for learning. However, this needs to be considered in conjunction with the fourth point, how mentally active, whether there's depth of processing in activities, how strongly learners engage with learning. In other words, we need to see practice not only in terms of quantity, but also of quality. The second chart makes a very brief summary of the main differences between traditional and communicative um, grammar, points that I think I've touched on um, as I've been talking. And with that, that's all I have to say for the moment, except to thank you for your attention. Thank you for not muting me or going off to feed your cat, if indeed that is the case. I would, of course, to be Please to attempt to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Dr. David. Very informative and very informative and very interesting as well. So we would like now to invite our colleagues to uh, please uh, um, direct Dr. David with their questions here. And uh, as we mentioned earlier, if you would like, if you prefer to use the microphone, you can just raise your hand so you can be unmuted. Right. Thank you very much. So insightful. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that's a great. So let's address your queries. Dr. David, um, okay, here is something which uh, we don't know to what extent uh, communicative grammar has been influenced by. Recently, not very even recently, but we have heard about uh, uh, changing the criteria of uh, learning English. So let's say that the ceiling has been lowered a little bit. Uh, so many things in the English language were sacrificed for the purpose as of uh, being able to speak English and deliver your ideas. 
Um, we have got a group of people. English as a lingua franca is what they are working on. And they started to say, you don't have to apply everything native speakers are doing, right? So they started to talk about uh, different uh, criteria for teaching and learning, right? So regarding the grammar, to what extent has teaching the grammar communicatively been influenced by that school of thought? Has it been influenced at all or no? Yes, please. Yes. And I think the, the, the first area of influence was already in the, the days of the communicative approach, where there was this um, slightly false dichotomy, dichotomy between accuracy and, and fluency. Um, now, first of all, you mentioned native speakers, and I certainly didn't mention native speakers. Um, my definition of, of, of um, standard grammar um, is um, systems shared by a speech community. Now, it, it's up to you to decide who this speech community might be. Um, it, it may be um, uh, 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 the Queen and her family. Um, it, it may be um, footballers and, and the way that they speak. But the whole point is that grammar is a, a, a system, a, a, a system. Grammar works systematically. Um, and uh, sometimes people um, play this aspect uh, down. Now, whose system it is, is a sociological um, matter. Now, if I'd had more time, in fact, one PowerPoint that I took out uh, was the aims of learning grammar, why we learn it. And one sentence in this definition was um, the aim of uh, speaking grammar is to speak meaningfully and correctly as possible. In other words, um, we're not talking about, we haven't got this mania for correctness, um, but, but using, for example, grammatical notions, um, in expressing intentions, um, making predictions or whatever, these are part of a, a system of communicating. Um, and if you don't use grammar, um, th this diminishes the degree to which you uh, communicate. So communication is the overall aim and grammar contributes to this uh, communication. Um, Eng English as a lingua franca, uh, I think is a purely sociological aspect. I don't think it's particularly relevant for second language acquisition. It's more a question of um, uh, what uh, varieties uh, you are going to focus on, but you might disagree with me there. Uh, I, I can't hear you. Uh, I you you're still muted. Okay. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, it seems that, yes, there is somehow some negotiation and disagreement about that. I can see that. Moving to another question from uh, Professor Shahada, Ali Shahada. Hello, Ali, Dr. Ali. He is asking, how would the, the framework of CC tie with the task-based language teaching? <clears throat> um, I think with task-based, <clears throat> you, you can see task-based with, with a small T, and task-based with, with a large T. Now, as you'll have noticed today, quite a lot of my activities have got tasks built, built into them, where in addition to the, the linguistic aim of learning a certain bit of grammar, there's also an overall aim of, of accomplishing some kind of task. You saw in the very last exercise that we did writing a report, for example, um, now, task-based approaches um, tend to um, look at syllabuses, um, look at teaching materials from the starting point of some kind of global task, which is an approach to language teaching, approach to materials design. Um, but this is not what I particularly am interested in. Um, I'm more interested in task-based with a small t relating to individual activities. Uh, yeah, thank you. And uh, 
Okay, uh, Victor Ali, if you need further comments or anything else, please go ahead. And I would like to remind the audience also that they can use the mic if they want to just raise your hand. And uh, uh, Nathan Waller, yes, Nathan Waller is asking, Dr. David, do you think that this applies to all age groups or do you think, uh, if, if you think, is there a minimum age where grammar should be taught explicitly at least for ESL students? Um, I, I don't think there's a minimum age when grammar can be taught, but I do think that um, teaching methods need to, to take account uh, of the age and the cognitive development of, of learners. Uh, it's sometimes said that younger learners are more receptive to um, implicit learning, so using uh, a learning by, by using approach. But having said that, I, I've seen videos of, of very young children analyzing language um, in, in language awareness classes and coming up with theories of, of, of language. Um, so we shouldn't, you know, exclude, say, any kind of analytical approach is not good for, for young learners. But I think we, we do need to take this in, into account. Um, can I just say at the upper end of the scale, you know, sometimes people have said, well, these are all games. It, it's not sort of serious grammar. I had a wonderful experience a couple of years ago in, in Japan doing a workshop for university teachers, um, quite a few of whom were elderly uh, professors uh, of English. And I, I watched with great, great joy how they sat in groups and played some of the games uh, that I've show, showed you today and, and engaged with them. Um, so I don't think there's any upper age uh, from when these uh, activities could be used. Certainly I use lots of games or used to at my own university and my own teaching there. I remember in one of the institutions that um, I joined recently, a long time ago, um, I started using what I have learned in my university to be communicative grammar, to be, you know, a grammar which is not a traditional way of teaching and learning. And I started to apply for the first time what I was taught when I was being prepared as an English language teacher. And I was shocked that many of my students in the Gulf here were telling me this teacher was not serious. She makes us play. She doesn't <laughs> use the time well in the class. It was like, it's a matter of attitude, but yes, absolutely. This is what they said to me about me. <laughs> so yeah, I agree with you. And we have got uh, Yahya, I will take your question shortly, but I think that uh, Jermaine, Jer uh, Jermaine, Jermaine, uh, you are putting your hand on. Would you like to speak Jermaine? You can speak now. Hello, Jermaine. Hi, Jermaine. Jermaine, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrongly. I'm really sorry. Um, okay. Jermaine? Okay, fine. We will get back to you after after we take the question from Yahya. Uh, Yahya uh, is asking, Okay, he's, uh, Yahya is asking about pedagogical grammar and is saying, uh, is pedagogical grammar related to what you have uh, you had discussed? <clears throat> um, <clears throat> by, by pedagogical grammar, I mean um, descriptions and theories of learning, which have the aim of facilitating learning in the, the foreign, foreign langu language class. So everything I've, I've said has been within the framework of pedagogical grammar. Um, having said that, um, the general area of, of cognitive linguistics, particularly when it concerns cognitive views of language description, these are very much areas of, of linguistics and don't necessarily um, look at applications for the classroom. It's just that I um, have picked out theories um, and elements of, of these theories that I feel can be uh, applied in pedagogical grammar as well. Right. 
Thank you. And um, Karina found the examples of the exercises you have given interesting and helpful. And she is she is also asking asking one extra point. Uh, and she hoped that these are as interesting as the exercise that you have presenting. So the point she was asking about uh, how do you think uh, teachers should deal with mistakes? <clears throat> <clears throat> How should they de deal with, with mistakes? My goodness, th this is a very big um, area. Um, one answer, of, of course, is, is, is don't, don't, don't bother to do this. This is a popular answer in communicative language teaching. Now, if we're teaching grammar, if we're um, choosing uh, grammatical objectives, then obviously, we want learners to get this grammar uh, correct. So, for example, if we're rehearsing um, expressing intentions with 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 going to, um, and students just use use uh, the present tense. Now, if it was a general communicative activity, I might not interfere. But if it's a grammar activity where we do have this specific uh, objective, then um, I would want to. Uh, undertake certain measures uh, to correct or to try and get learners to use the meaningful and correct uh, form. Um, I mean, basically, you know, you're then looking at why are learners making mistakes? Um, usually because learning has not um, been very effective and needs more, more recycling, um, not through explanation, but through more practice activities uh, of the right kind. But I know that's not a very satisfactory answer, and I don't think I can, as it's such a big area, I can't do better than that at the moment. Uh, it is understood, and we hope that in the sessions of the conference about teaching and learning skills and sub skills, including the grammar, maybe such points can be touched upon and can be discussed among the panelists as well. And we have got another question, another question from uh, Mohammed. Mohammed is saying, uh, thank you so much, interesting, and he needs to know how can we apply what you have been discussing in large uh, classes, mm -hmm. right? Uh, speci especially if they are mixed ability classes. So he's asking about the implications in particular of these classes mm -hmm. with in, in mixed uh, level environment uh, of ESL students, as well mm -hmm. as bigger group students. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, Mohammed, I, I, I understand uh, the problem uh, fully. Um, and, and certainly since the, the methodology of communicative grammar does involve um, uh, quite a lot of, lot of group work, um, if you've got large classes, this may be difficult to organize. I mean, I had a, um, once a grammar class of 80 students um, at one institution in Graz and, and still managed to organize group work, but it wasn't very um, easy. Um, now, perhaps I can just move the question in a slightly different direction because it, it really concerns contexts of learning. Um, it concerns le as well learning cultures, teaching cultures. Um, as I think you mentioned, uh, Dr. Wafa, I, I spent three years in Kuwait teaching at the language center uh, there. Uh, and I also had an evening class, which I held, um, I think for uh, mainly bank in employees, employees working in firms and so on. Um, and th these were from different countries of the, the Arab world. Um, and in addition to using a fairly traditional book, I tried to use um, group work from time to time. Now, one uh, night I went into the evening class and the head of the program dragged me into his office and said, Mr. Newby, uh, Mr. David, there have been complaints for your students. Uh, you're not teaching them properly. And of course, I, I immediately realized what this was. Now, in their learning culture, they were not used to being alone in a group without the, the guidance, the wisdom uh, of the teacher. Uh, they didn't feel that learning amongst each other was, was quality learning. This was back in the early 1980s when I was sort of uh, very eager to use communicative 
uh, methods. So th this was something that I, I had to deal with, and I, I, I tried to take them on board and explain the advantages uh, of, of this. So, <clears throat> you know, basically there are these learning culture problems and class size is, is, is one of them. Okay, thank you. I can see uh, Dr. Mario Moya in, uh, is in our list of attendees in this uh, in this group. Dr. Mario is another keynote speaker, so wait for him also that day. Thank you, Dr. Mario, for joining us. Dr. David, again, uh, the colleagues from Austria are insisting on talking more about uh, how to correct grammar mistakes. Right, how do they deal with them? So this is an issue for, for them. Again, other questions about that. But I assume, as you said, Yanni, um, what the answer you have given to us is within the limitations that can be given um, right now, because it is in its own right, totally a new area, right? A different area that mm -hmm. uh, maybe can be touched upon other occasions, true? Um, I'll just make one point. Huh? <clears throat> um, you know, it, it, it's a basic need that we, and I include myself, we teachers have <clears throat> to, to correct mistakes. In the classroom, if we hear a, a student make a mistake, immediately you know, we want to correct it. Um, and, and the big question is, uh, what will happen as, as the result of our correction? You know, it might satisfy us and perhaps uh, the learner because there has been a correction, but will it lead to a long-term uh, effect? So th this is the complicated thing. Um, and, and so th this is why I see you then need to look at teaching strategies and consider how you might reteach something if you think the mistake uh, is, is worth correcting, of course. And let's remember what we said at the beginning, all of us make mistakes in a foreign language. We're not looking for a myth of perfection. Right. And I'll now direct, we will direct the question from uh, Sufyan right now and the other question from Sahar. Sufyan is asking, is there a special business grammar? Sorry, is there a special? Business grammar? Business grammar. <laughs> yes. <laughs> business um, grammar. I, I don't know about business grammar. I mean, uh, when I was in Kuwait, I also had an evening class for, for doctors uh, teaching medical English. Now, today I hadn't spoken at all about the whole language side of communicative grammar. Um, how, you, how you describe uh, grammar, um, how you categorize it, how you explain it. Um, all I've mentioned briefly is this meaning perspective, what I call notional grammar, where um, a, 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 a curriculum or a syllabus, a grammatical syllabus, would consist of meanings rather than forms such as the present perfect or the past tense. So when I was teaching medical English in Kuwait, it was very interesting because you could look at the kind of situations that doctors found themselves in, in their hospitals, in their practice, and then you could look at the grammatical notions that they were likely to need and use. So just as you, in, in teaching language for specific purposes, you can select vocabulary which corresponds to the needs of specific groups of learners. So you can do the same with, with grammatical notions. You can focus on uh, that those meanings which are, are used particularly in, in certain spheres of profess, professional uh, life. So first of all, you need to find out what do the business people do with language in global terms, and then what grammatical meanings might they need to express to carry out these uh, professional activities. Yeah, um, we will try just to finish up with the little questions. We have got very few questions left, although they are coming up, but we will limit them to <laughs> another two or three only. But Jamie, um, J Jeremy, Jeremy, would you like to speak now? I can unmute you. Would you like to speak now? Jeremy? Jeremy? Never mind. Never mind. Khalas. Okay, because the hand is on and I don't want to miss anybody. Mm -hmm. Tayyip Sahar is asking. Now, this is something I think many people are always criticizing or are worried about whenever we find it difficult to teach grammar to our students. Now, Sahar is asking, she's saying, 
what is important? Um, what is more important to convey the message or follow the grammatical rules? I need your opinion, please. Um, one thing that I had to <laughs> take out of my lecture um, was a little session on, on grammatical rules. Now, what are gr grammatical rules? Grammatical rules are regularities based on how people communicate. So a grammatical rule describes the underlying system stored in the brain that causes a person to use this form or that form or another form. So um, grammatical rules are not in any way in contradiction to meaning and, and messages. This does happen in some, with some grammarians um, who put forward rules. I mean, to give you one example, um, indirect speech. You know, you'll find in all, almost all grammar books, except mine, this section where it says indirect speech, right? First of all, you start with direct speech and then you transform it into indirect speech. Now, these are so-called rules, but if you look at real life, this is absolute bizarre because we don't do that. I mean, imagine we had a conversation on Monday, um, Wafa. Now, I can't remember anything you said and you can't remember anything I said, but we can still report it. Um, you told me that I would be sent a link before this session today. Um, you told me that I would be allowed to click and show my screen and so on. Now, I'm reporting what you said, but I'm not reporting your words. I'm reporting your semantic message, the ideas that you put across to me. So when people report, they don't report words at all or speech. They report ideas. And this is a totally uh, different approach. So I would say these shifting rules have got nothing to do with grammar. They're a convention that years ago um, grammarians thought up and this has been perpetuated um, through language teaching. Um, the real rules are, are, are semantic rules um, and looking at how people depict this past situation. Uh, and all, all of my grammar book is based on this idea, all the teaching I do. Uh, I should say that this is one reason why hardly anyone buys my grammar book, because they think the rules aren't in there, because they want these, these shifting uh, rules. So basically, rules should explain communication. And if they don't, then they're the wrong rules. And remember that grammar rules and don't come from above. They're, they come from human beings who sit down in their studies and write them. Right. And there are two very important questions, Dr. David. I hope that you can agree with them, that they are very important. One of them is from Hanan, and she is asking, um, does L1 have any role in teaching grammar communicatively? <clears throat> uh, students um, first line. Yeah, go ahead. I think one has a, a much bigger and more important role than in traditional grammar. I mean, basically, in traditional grammar, teachers tend to be fairly limited to explaining and then giving their pupils exercises. Um, one thing about communicative grammar is that it places far more demands uh, on, on the teacher, as with many aspects of communicative teaching, than traditional grammar, traditional teaching does. So the, the teacher still has the role of setting grammatical objectives, deciding what he or she uh, wants to teach. He or she has the role of selecting activities which they which he feels will be beneficial in the acquisition of grammar. So it's a very similar role, but in a way it's a more professional role because there are more things to take into account. For example, learning theories, looking at a range of activities, looking at different ways that different learners might have of acquiring grammar. Right. And we have got, this is the second question I'm telling you to be very interesting. And this is from Andrea. Andrea is asking, she's saying that she's very interested in research and she would like to do to do a research in the grammar, which can fill a gap. And that is definitely needed. 
So um, she is asking, can you please suggest possible research focus or area based on your experience in this field that we can explore related to the teaching of the grammar in a highly multilingual context? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, sometimes when I, when I go to conferences, particularly if um, applied linguists are there, and I make the sort of claims uh, that I've made today, then immediately questions come, but where is your research to prove it? <laughs> now, theory and research have got different facets. Uh, one is, is um, theory formulation, um, putting together bundles of theories that can be used in the classroom. And this is the area that I'm mainly uh, involved in. Um, but actually proving that um, this method might be better than, say, traditional teaching um, is, is very difficult because there are so many variables. Um, first of all, you've got to decide, you know, how you're going to compare. Um, for example, if you want to look at um, which group using which method might have best acquired the grammar, um, how are you going to do that? I mean, if uh, if you're going to give exercises, um, then those pupils that are used to doing that kind of exercise are likely to, pe to perform best. So um, because there are so many variables, there are all sorts of design issues um, uh, to do this. And this is something that I've often thought about, but um, because I haven't been so involved in empirical research, which of course nowadays mo most researchers are, uh, I, I haven't really gone gone down this path. And I don't think it's a particularly easy path to do. But if, uh, I, I'm sorry, I missed, missed the name of the person uh, uh, asking the question, um, has some ideas, I'd be very interested Andrea. to hear them. This is Andrea, as far as I can remember. Let me scroll up again, but she is uh, Andrea. Right, okay. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, now, uh, thank you so much, Dr. David. I know that there, there might be some more questions. And please, please accept my apologies if there are always limitations regarding the coverage of the questions and being unable always to, to take everything. Um, I've done my best to take as much questions as I can. And I think I feel now, I'm, I'm sorry, Dr. David, Yanni. I just carried on asking, asking, asking a question. <laughs> well, I should have asked Yanni, should, it's too much, right? I'm really sorry about that. But um, I really like the questions from our colleague, uh, colleagues and I like their engagement as well, which is mm -hmm. great. So I think at this point we can stop uh, this session. I would like to thank Dr. David Newby uh, so much for this very interesting and very rich uh, and engaging session on a topic which is lively and which is always and always controversial in teaching and learning English. So thank you so much, Dr. David. And I would like to thank all our audience, wherever you have joined us from. Thank you so much for being us today and for, for all the attention that you have given to us 